This might be the most important nutrient that you can consume on a daily basis for its widespread benefits, including cancer. You'll see exactly what I mean when we dive into the cancer studies, but I'm curious if you can guess what it is based on a few physiological clues that I'll offer. Clue number one, according to mechanistic data, something that promotes cancer progression is cholesterol. So in fact, we can see that partly evidenced here, where three different human cancer cell lines were exposed to cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, seen here. We have two of the human cancers and the researchers measured the aggressiveness or the migration of these cancer cells when exposed to the cholesterol containing lipoprotein. So LDL there on the right or not the control on the left. The higher the bars, the worse the cancer aggression, indicating LDL exposure increases certain cancer aggression. Now there's the first hint. The nutrient we're going over reduces cholesterol levels through a number of mechanisms, including reducing the absorption. Clue number two, there's a huge study wherein the researchers show that bile, so a yellow green fluid that your liver produces can turn harmful and become pro-cancerous. Typically bile is produced by your liver in a conjugated form and it helps remove cholesterol, remove waste products and help in digestion. However, in your gut microbiome, where billions of bacteria live, can convert depending on the bacterium conjugated bile to unconjugated bile. We see that here. The orange bar is the bacterium that has the enzyme for converting conjugated to unconjugated bile. Clearly, there's an increase relative to the left bacterium without that enzyme. Okay, but why do we care? Well, for one, the more unconjugated bile, as seen here, the more tumors. Orange is the condition with more unconjugated bile. Technically, that's an association, but the study goes on to show more definitive proof to implicate unconjugated bile as carcinogenic. But we aren't going to dominate this with bile talk. The second reason we care is because the second clue for our mystery molecules function is here. The nutrient blocks the conversion of conjugated bile to unconjugated bile, keeping it in its safe form. Specifically, it can bind bile acid salts and stop them from being absorbed, but it also encourages the production of bacteria that don't have the enzyme expression for this bile conversion. That enzyme is called bile salt hydrolase, which is why we saw BSH under the bars earlier. Okay, two clues. Let's do one more because it's fascinating what this nutrient does to your body. We've been focused so much on the effects on the gut and it might be reasonable to say, okay, okay, it might prevent gut derived cancers like colon cancer, but can we branch that out and look at cancers that extend far away like breast cancer is one example. In this study, researchers treated breast cancer cells with a molecule tightly related to our nutrient of interest and measured over days the growth of these cancer cells. Here, we see the growth of the cells. The further up the lines go, the more cancer cells there are over time on the horizontal axis. So, up is bad. We're comparing against the control there, the cancer cells growing unexposed to the molecule of the study. Clearly, at all concentrations, there's at least a slowing of the cancer cell division, so the number of cancer cells. What's especially remarkable is that at the highest concentrations, we're seeing a lot of cancer death, as we see the lines dip below the starting point. So, this molecule in greater concentrations that is produced by the nutrient that we're about to unveil is dealing a serious anti-cancer punch so that's the third clue. This molecule is produced from our nutrient of interest. So we have a collection of clues. It reduces cholesterol. It stops intestinal conversion of bile acids to cancer promoting forms, and it gets converted to a potent anti-cancer molecule. Before we get to guessing, I should note that these three studies, while telling, aren't foolproof. We'd need uh, more evidence, but I'm giving you only a sample of the total literature on the topic, as each of these could be separate investigations in their own right. There's so much more to say. Anyway, what do you think the nutrient is? Let's do multiple choice. A, omega-3 fats. B, statin drugs. C, dietary fiber. Or D, curcumin. If you choose B, I'd like to know what you consider a nutritious meal. I have concerns. 
Well, they all have merit, but only one fulfills all three of these clues, and that's dietary fiber, of course. If you got it right, that's pretty impressive. If you've uh, seen my coverage on butyrate, that uh, third clue, you had an advantage. But even so, the other two are not as intuitive, so nice work. Okay, we have three studies and actually one systematic review that I didn't discuss that indicate that dietary fiber provides multiple mechanistic benefits in combating cancer. But that just isn't good enough because we should get into more human data and also getting into how much fiber is optimal for potential cancer benefits. I say potential because mechanistic research is simply not enough to get a clear real world idea if something is actually going to help. We need more long-term human research. How about an analysis of over 350,000 people? Bring it on in here. In this analysis, researchers had data that was collected from around 500,000 people and slimmed it down to about 350,000 because they removed people who already had cancer or their fiber intake data was missing. Then they tried to find the relationship between fiber intake and a bunch of different type cancer types from lung cancer to cervical cancer to kidney, prostate, breast, uterine, colorectal, and more. Okay. I'll go ahead and tell you that the results aren't as cut and dry as the mechanistic data. Let's walk through it. When looking at all the cancers put together, that's 21 different regions of the body, I think like something like 17 types of cancer, if I remember correctly, we see that here. You see that line running down the middle? That's the baseline risk that we're comparing against. Technically, the lowest fiber tier at the top has its data on that line. So lowest meaning the lowest fiber consumption. And then as you pan down, fiber intake increases with the final one trend indicating the average change as you go from one quintile upward to the next. If the squares move to the left, there's reduced risk of cancer, and the lines coming out of the squares, known as confidence intervals, indicate the certainty of the data. So the smaller, the better. And if they don't cross the middle baseline, then that indicates a statistically identified effect, or relationship in this case. I'm telling you all this because I'm gonna be throwing some curveballs at you shortly. But overall, all cancers combined, there's clearly reduced risk correlated with fiber consumption. And the more, the better, with about a 10% reduced risk in overall cancer at the highest intake. We'll get into what that is soon. Yet, these data are correlational. So, the researchers also did a bunch of adjustments to control for potential confounding factors like these. We'll return to that. But while we could close the book on this and just finish it by saying, yay, all right, fiber fights cancer. That's not entirely true based on the data. For example, if we look at uterine cancer, the results indicate no relationship, so no benefit of fiber. The most likely explanation is that there's insufficient data because the confidence intervals that we talked about earlier indicate a lot of uncertainty. On the other hand, even cancers with greater certainty like prostate cancer indicate no relationship. Yet breast esophageal, and lung cancers, to name a few, show a relationship between fiber intake and reduced cancer risk. In fact, lung cancer risk is reduced by over 30% at the highest fiber intakes. As an interesting side note, the researchers point out that the effect is not present in people who have never smoked. So, the big point here is that there are likely two factors at play here. One, some of these cancers we don't have enough data to say with certainty. Two, some cancers may not be as positively impacted by fiber consumption. It may be cancer specific, even if we pool all the cancers together and see a positive relationship. However, we can say this, the relationship between high fiber intake and all included cancers is either neutral or positive, with none indicating a harmful relationship. So that leaves us with how much fiber is best. By the way, if you'd like a deeper analysis on all this, breaking each cancer down for you, along with different types of fiber, how it affects different subgroups of people and more, check out the full analysis of this video that you're watching. It's included for the Physionic Insiders, along with a private podcast, articles every week, an extensive video library, live sessions with me and more. And it's an awesome community over there. Would love to have you join. And the link to join is in the description box.
So remember when we discussed the lowest to highest fiber intake, the lowest was less than 10 grams or so per day, and the highest was around 19 grams and higher. But that's still too general because it doesn't detail how much above 19 grams. 19 grams is a minimum for what we just went over, but is 30 grams better than 19 grams? Well, sometimes more is not better. Unfortunately, the large analysis that we've been leaning on just doesn't offer those answers. But fortunately, this analysis does. You like how I got all depressed like uh, we weren't going to get the answers and then I came in and saved the day for the problem that I artificially created. The roller coaster of data. So while this analysis focused on breast cancer, and yes, they also found a relationship with reduced risk shown here, by the way, when I was only a few years old, I was already publishing cancer studies. I was a genius child. That or that's someone else with the same last name, whichever is more believable to you. I know you're leaning towards the former and I'm flattered, but uh, just know that a lot of different people have called me an idiot in the past. So back to the point, fiber is linked to reduced breast cancer. Then the researchers indicated a dose response curve on intake here. If we see the lines go down, that's reduced risk, with the dotted line on either side indicating the certainty, like the confidence intervals that we discussed earlier. The horizontal axis is where the answer lies. It's the fiber dose. Clearly, going beyond 19 grams indicates further benefit, at least up to 30 grams or so. Then, although the solid black line continues down, the confidence intervals widen, indicating greater uncertainty. Even so, the highest these data go up to is about 40 grams. So, what to make of all that? 30 grams seems a safe bet, but it does seem like more probably won't have any negative effects in regard to cancer relationships. So you might reap even more reward going higher than 30 grams. Now, one final warning before we package this all up into a quick summary of everything. Remember when I mentioned uh, this? Yet these data are correlational. So. The researchers also did a bunch of adjustments to control for potential confounding factors like these. I'm bringing that back up because that means that we typically can't make cause and effect statements on fiber and cancer. It's always possible some other unaccounted for factor is tracking with fiber that's actually causing these effects. However, there are more than just the studies that we've just been over. There are many, many, many more studies with all with varying ways of slicing and dicing the data and in massive samples of people across different living situations, uh, health, ages, and much more. And virtually all of them come to the same conclusion. Dietary fiber reduces cancer risk. So the evidence beyond the ones that we've covered is very strong. That leaves us with a few main points to take home with us. One, dietary fiber has multiple discovered mechanisms by which it reduces cancer risk, but also directly stresses cancer cells. Two, dietary fiber reduces overall cancer risk, but the evidence is mixed on different types of cancer. Some show a positive relationship and some show a neutral for varying reasons. But the overall point is that there's robust evidence indicating dietary fiber is good for you if you care about reducing your cancer risk. Three, the optimal amount of dietary fiber is at least 30 grams of fiber on average, with more being potentially better. If you are consuming less than that, you are likely at increased relative cancer risk. Now, you know how I mentioned there's this molecule that gets produced from fiber and it kills cancer cells? In fact, there's a tricky but mind-blowingly cool way that it overwhelms cancer, but only in certain contexts. I covered that in this next video right here. Check it out. Thanks for tuning in.